Hello all, and thank you so much for tuning in to this YouTube live stream. Wherever you're watching from, I hope you and your family are safe. I'm Lara Brown, I'm the Women's Officer of the Cambridge Union, and tonight we'll be asking the question, is COVID-19 the end of the European project? A really timely topic, um, and, on, and one which is particularly close to my heart. For the format, I'm going to be moderating a relaxed discussion between our four panellists. This is not a debate as such, and if you yourself have any questions, the YouTube chat will be open for you to pose them. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first of our four speakers. Maria, Maria Grassa Carvalho has represented Portugal in the European Parliament since 2019 as part of the Social Democratic Bloc. She has previously served as Minister of Science at the national level in Portugal from 2003 to 2005. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone. And let me start by thanking the Cambridge Union for the kind invitation to be part of this panel and a special word also of thanks to the members of the panel and to uh, Lara, the moderator. Uh, it's truly an honor to participate in the event hosted by one of the oldest uh, debate societies in the world, one that has, has given voice to so many bigger than life speakers from Winston Churchill to Bill Gates. Having said that, I fear that my intervention will lack the eloquence of these predecessors, since the first answer that comes to my mind to your question, the question that is in the title of this panel is the coronavirus, the end of the European project, requires a very simple uh, answer from my side, a two letter word that is no. Indeed, I do not believe that uh, this crisis will be the end of the European Union. On the contrary, um, in fact, I believe that this situation will re uh, result in a reinforce of the European Union and of its competence. And uh, it, it will demonstrate once again that to solve complex issues, global threats, we need to be working together in order to reach a critical mass required to address these issues. When we come to think of it, it's always been like that uh, in the European project. If we look back, for example, at the Schuman Declaration that we just celebrate the seventh birthday, uh, it was a commitment to work side by side made by a group of nations that have been fighting to each other in war in the previous 40 years. Those initial signatories knew then, as we know now, that this is the road to build on the achievements rather than intentions. And regarding the corona crisis, Europe is starting to lay the foundations that will lead to these achievements. It's true that there was an hesitation in the beginning. It's a new situation for uh, many of us, uh, probably for the last century, only the Spanish flu had the same magnitude of the problem of the present one. So there was some hesitation special in particular for the, from the European Council. But we have now a strong commitment to deal with this pandemic, both at European level and even going beyond European borders to have a global response. For example, the initiative of the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der, Leyen, von der Leyen, on the coronavirus global response that UK also answered immediately and is ever involved, is a, a very good example how we can deal uh, with these complex threats that are global threats. At that initiative, European Union, European Commission with Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, uh, Norway, Spain, United Kingdom, joined efforts um, and answer to an initiative that was a response to the call from the World Health Organization to have a fund of a, a, around 7.4 billion euro uh, to invest in the development and production and the distribution um, of a vaccine for
for the coronavirus and also uh, for therapies. So this is a very good example that we cannot work alone against global threats. But the answer to the European, the European answer to the COVID-19 is already visible beyond the health uh, questions. Um, we are also uh, having a strong answer in the economic field. We have taken decisions and actions to address the economic emergency caused by this crisis, pro providing much needed liquidity to business and to the citizens. And something has happened because for the first time, we have agreed to share risks in terms of access to credit. It was a decision um, just announced by the European Commission and wrote this week uh, until today in the plenary in the European Parliament, where uh, the European Commission in the next budget and in the next recovery plan will go to the uh, financial marking, uh, markets, giving the European budget as guarantees in order to borrow money that will make it accessible to the member states and to the companies and through that to the citizens. So that was the first time that in the history of the European uh, Union, we have agreed of such uh, an, an action. We also have a strong and larger European budget. Uh, that was unsinkable just two or three months ago. And many member states wanted to lower the, 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 the size of the European budget. Now, there is an overall agreement that we really need a higher European budget to make a face to the economic problems. And we'll have also for the first time more competence. For example, we start having competence in the health sector. Health was, until now, a member state's competence. Only very small things such as uh, uh, movement of uh, patients across borders, rare diseases were dealt at European level. Everything else on the health domain was done and responsibility of the member states. Now, it is proposed for the next seven years, we will have a true European level policy and program for health issues. Um, I often mention the empowerment that comes from working together that give us critical mass uh, to solve the problems. And the coronavirus is not the only example. We have plenty of examples uh, of issues that are of importance crucial importance for humanity that we really need to look and to try to find solutions working together. I, I give you two examples, emerging and global diseases and climate change. Starting with the, the, the diseases, when the EBOA came, Europe made a commitment to develop the vaccine, was also a big consortium and we managed, so it was an European initiative that managed to find a solution and the vaccine for the Ebola that was also a terrible virus. Uh, another example where UK has been leading uh, in, in, um, in most of the projects is the Global Health Partnership for the clinical trials on AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis is a, a long, um, time uh, uh, public to public partnership that has started in 2003. I had the privilege as a minister to propose this to the European Union and is now a fact. Uh, it involves 14 uh, European countries, the European Commission, and 16 African uh, nations, and they developed fantastic work in Africa. Uh, to develop uh, therapies uh, and uh, to work on the development of new vaccines for the AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. The other example is climate change. CO2 emissions do not recognize borders. And 
when we do negotiations uh, in the United Nations, for example, during the COP, the, the, the big um, uh, meetings where the negotiations take place, that will the next one will be in the UK, uh, Europe acts as a block. And through that, Europe increases its power and is able to push the fight against climate, uh, climate change as European has been one of the blocks in the world that has more ambitions towards the fight against climate change. And we managed to get our position through because we are together. So going back to the initial question, I would like to replace the question that is the title of our debate for a new one, special to my British colleagues that are present in the panel. If the Brexit referend was happening now in the middle of the current crisis, do you believe that the result will be the same? Do you believe that the majority of the voters would, stay, would say no to the remain? Or do you think that they had value the fact that was very important that the joint UK joint efforts with the European Commission and other countries in order to, for example, bring the UK citizens from all over the world with the planes in a joint effort and promoted by the European Commission. I think that some of the British people that were so devoted to Brexit probably now have some doubts. And that even there to say that even Boris Johnson might have some doubts about this position because he realized that in the middle of this big crisis, to work together, the solution will come from there. The good news is that I believe that this crisis will also help us to establish a new relationship between the UK and the European Union. And Britain and the Union will work side by side to fight COVID and we will manage, I'm sure. And after that, the remaining difference will be much easier to address. So thank you very much. Thank you, Maria, for that absolutely fascinating set of insights. Sorry. I'd like to now welcome Vince Cable to the floor. Vince Cable served as leader of Liberal, De Liberal Democrats from 2017 to 2019 and as MP for Twickenham from 1997 to 2015 and again from 2017 to 2019. He was Secretary of State for Business, Innovation and Skills in the coalition government from 2010 and 2015. He's a graduate of Fitzwilliam Cambridge and a former president of our union. Vince Cable, the floor is yours. Well, first of all, um, thank you for inviting me back. I think the last time I spoke to the Union, it was um, opposing the idea that we have a special relationship with the United States. And everything we've seen of the Trump administration in the last year rather, think, rather confirms the good judgment of the Union at the time. Uh, on this subject that we're talking about, I mean, I'm very clear on my position. I'm a strong supporter of the European project. I'm fundamentally optimistic that they will cope with this crisis and I greatly regret that Britain is no longer part of it. But having said that, it is going to be put under uh, extraordinary strain, um, not so much because of the pandemic itself, though that's a big enough problem to handle, but because of the economic consequences which are potentially horrendous. Uh, you know, we are talking about a depression uh, on the scale of the interwar depression and much worse than the financial crisis 10 years ago. But I'll just make a series of specific points. I mean, first of all, um, the, the nature of the way that the pandemic has been dealt with, uh, but by its very nature, is stopping one of the fundamental principles of the union, which is free movement. Um, and we're stopping free movement within countries as well as between them. Uh, but this isn't just a European problem. I mean, you may have seen that uh, in India, for example, there are now border posts between different states. And that kind of breakdown is happening in many parts of the world. We're seeing a real fragmentation. And it would be 
amazing if um, you know a Europe without frontiers were to survive um, this particular episode. Uh, there is still a, a good deal of movement taking place, but lockdown uh, is overriding that. Uh, secondly, um, the whole principle of the single market, which was the basis on which uh, Britain was a member of the European Union, uh, is necessarily breaking down because, at least in the short run, you know, some industries are producing, others have been stopped from producing by their own government. So the whole concept of free trade within the European Union is rather meaningless until we get past that. Um, but again, this isn't just a problem within the European Union. We're getting an enormous amount of divergence within the UK. I mean, we've now got Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland pursuing fundamentally different regulatory systems in uh, a key area of life. Uh, and the, the same thing is happening in the United States. So you're getting in, in the phrase regulatory divergence, I mean, not just in the European Union, but throughout the, the world. Um, and I, the question is, when we get to the end of this, will we pull it together again? Now, a third point which is linked to that is, is there enough sense of solidarity within the union uh, to cope with the stresses that are now coming? Uh, initially, as Maria acknowledged, uh, the European Union got off to a bad start. Uh, there wasn't uh, the necessary help for Italy. Uh, everybody scrambled to look after their own interests, but I think since then the position is greatly improved. Uh, a big loan was approved for Italy, and crucially, it wasn't. It didn't have conditionality attached to it, which was the the real problem that the Italians had, and we've got past that. I think a fourth point is that the the real pressure in Europe is going to come through the monetary union. The monetary union was under a great deal of strain in the financial crisis, and it's now potentially under even bigger strain. Um, it, it got off to actually, to uh, com compared with the, the solidarity issue, the monetary union got off to a very good start because the European Central Bank committed itself to doing whatever it needed to keep uh, the monetary union going, uh, buying up disproportionate amounts of bonds from weaker countries like Italy, uh, and that's happened. Uh, we now in the last week have a new threat in the form of the judgment of the German Constitutional Court, uh, which is challenging uh, the way that the ECB is functioning. And that is potentially an existential issue. Um, the, the Constitutional Court is acting way beyond actually its powers. Um, it shouldn't be dictating to the European Central Bank. The treaty uh, protects the European Central Bank from that kind of uh, member state interference. Uh, but um, the ECB now has the challenge of telling the European, uh, uh, telling the German court to go away. Uh, and that is potentially a crisis point. Um, and we don't know how they're going to surmount that. Uh, I hope they will. And actually, it may be that under great pressure, the Monetary Union does things which should have been done before, uh, but have been ducked so far, like having much bigger transfer payments, something the, um, the Germans have been resisting. But as Maria said, there is now a bigger budget. Um, there is much more scope for um, making a common monetary area actually work. Um, finally, um, you know, there, there are some problems which were there even before the pandemic. Uh, there's the problem of Britain. Um, Brexit could still be a terrible mess. Um, we have no agreement on the end of the transition. Um, the British at least give the impression that they're looking for a um, bit of a punch up uh, with Barnier. Uh, would not be helpful at a time when investor confidence is absolutely on the floor and it could lead to a lot of bad blood. I hope that won't happen, but it is a threat hanging over us at the moment. Uh, another problem the European Union has so far ducked is what to do about Hungary. I mean, Hungary is no longer even remotely a democratic country. It's very difficult to see how its continued membership is compatible with the principles of the Union. And the EU will need to tackle that. 
and then either get the Hungarians to row back from some of their extraordinary uh, dictatorial commitments or to kick them out. Uh, and that will be a big challenge, uh, which so far hasn't been faced. So, you know, real challenges, political and economic, but all our experience of the history of the European Union is that when they get into a hole, they do manage to dig themselves out of it and actually go on to become stronger. And I'm confident that this is what will happen on this occasion, but it's not going to be easy. Really fascinating set of insights. I'd now like to welcome Ben Hall to speak. Ben Hall is Europe editor at the Financial Times. He was previously world news editor, Europe news editor, Paris correspondent, UK political correspondent, deputy comma editor, and a leader writer. Ben Hall, the floor is yours. Hi, Lara. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk to the Cambridge Union. Um, I spent four happy years of my life at Cambridge, St John's College, fantastic place. Um, pleased to be back virtually. Um, I also uh, don't think this is the end of the European project, um, but at the risk of uh, striking a kind of uh, Anglo-Saxon alliance with Vince, I am more pessimistic than Maria about um, uh, the Europe's handling of the crisis so far and of the effects that this will have in the years to come. Um, it is still very early, um, but I think we can say that the experience so far has been pretty bruising for European institutions that could have long lasting and debilitating effects. Um, what perhaps the salient feature of this crisis so far has been the, the massive expansion of the role of the state, whether enforcing uh, the lockdown, uh, telling, forcing people to stay at home, ramping up the health response, um, supporting businesses and workers through an unprecedented slump. Um, but the bit of the state that has not expanded it, it, its uh, presence has been the European part. Um, the European authorities, with the notable exception of the European Central Bank, as Vince just mentioned, um, have taken a, a largely a back seat in this crisis. Um, that's kind of understandable in the sense that uh, so many of these powers are uh, crisis related powers are national powers, not European powers. Um, but even so, I think the European institutions, particularly the European uh, Commission, has struggled to make itself uh, heard and felt, with some notable exceptions like the uh, uh, pandemic fund um, uh, for viruses and treatments that Maria mentioned, and other efforts like um, pooling procurement of medical equipment, although much of it turns out to be defective, the stuff they've brought from China so far, um, and efforts to stop individual national countries from uh, uh, essentially defending their own interests um, and not, for example, blocking the export of medical equipment in the very early days of this crisis, the European Commission did um, try and shut that down with some success. Um, but I think it is not an exaggeration to say that the European Commission's big achievements so far have been stepping out of the way. Um, uh, they have, um, the thing that Brussels has done best is undoing things. Um, uh, and, and they've been right to do that, suspending the fiscal rules that would have constrained governments from, um, from supporting businesses and, uh, and workers, um, uh, suspending the very strict limitations on state aid, uh, and uh, uh, obviously allowing countries to impose border controls, so uh, suspending free movement, uh, as Vince already mentioned. Um, so what we have seen over recent months, and there are good reasons for doing so, uh, but nonetheless are some of the EU's most important achievements being rolled back or set aside, open borders, free competitive markets, budgetary coordination. The question is, how quickly can these be restored? Will they ever be restored fully? And to what extent will we see a much weaker European Union after this crisis because national governments are back in the driving seat and won't allow those things to be fully restored? You can um, just, just take one example. This, this trend was already underway before this crisis. A, a push to 
uh, push towards sort of deglobalization or um, uh, bringing back more production uh, to Europe. Um, we, before the crisis, it was couched in the terms of um, strategic uh, industrial policy uh, and innovation and making sure that we had value chains, important value chains like um, making batteries for, for electric vehicles, for example, in Europe, not just importing them all from China. That trend is going to be, I think, massively um, amplified and accelerated by this crisis, partly under the guise of resilience. We, we you know, we figured out that we needed all of our medical equipment, a lot of our medical equipment and masks and uh, ingredients for, 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 for medications and pharmaceuticals uh, from China and to a lesser extent from India. And uh, in a race for global procurement, Europe has uh, not always been at the front of the queue. So you can imagine this, there's gonna be a lot more bringing back um, production to Europe. The question for me is to what extent does that extend to lots and lots of other sectors? And the other question is, will this be brought back to Europe or will this be an excuse for individual governments to say, this production needs to be brought back to my country? In other words, a kind of res resurgence of economic nationalism. I think that's potentially a deep worry. Hopefully the commission can roll that back, but it remains to be seen. Um, Another thing that has uh, inevitably happened in this crisis is that uh, is, I'm afraid, a demotion of the green agenda. Uh, this was the defining mission uh, of the European Commission under Ursula von der Leyen. She had made it her big, uh, her big campaign. Uh, it was a rather audacious bet, in my view, and potentially risky one. Um, but this inevitably has been uh, pushed to one side. Now, it is quite possible that in the process of rebuilding uh, and recovery and uh, investing to get our economies going again, you can do that in a way which accelerates the shift to green technologies and low carbon technologies. But it's also equally possible that when households and businesses are struggling to survive, people, there are masses of people unemployed, people have less spending power and less willingness to spend this transition is gonna be a lot harder to achieve. Um, and I think undoubtedly that that objective has, has been set back. Um, I think the biggest danger to, to the European project, as Vince mentioned, is the Eurozone and the widening divergences between North and South. Um, this because by, uh, unfortunately, Spain and Italy have been the hardest hit um, by this virus and they were also in the worst position or, or weaker positions um, given that they had high unemployment uh, uh, and high debt and, and problems with deficits um, and therefore they have less room to support their economies which means they are going to be have a weaker recovery. I think that is a very deep worry for the eurozone that does bring into question um, uh, the issue of debt sustainability, certainly in Italy and quite possibly in Spain. Uh, Greece is a slightly different question because it uh, has a lot of its funding needs covered by the European institutions for a number of years. But that, that question is going to come roaring back. And um, it's not absolutely clear that there is a solution to it. Um, it is quite possible that we will see, as Jean Monnet said, um, Europe is built in a crisis and that... Uh, the European authorities will come up with a very large um, recovery fund, rescue fund, that will have real macroeconomic significance. So it will really help relieve the burden on Spain and Italy and allow help them to get through this crisis. But I think there is, uh, Maria said this was a done deal, that there was a bigger budget. Uh, it's not a done deal yet. I think there's gonna be some hard bargaining still to come on this and there's a real risk that this is actually is not a very meaningful budget at the end of the day that a lot of the money will be given out as loans cheap loans maybe but as loans which will still add to the debt pile of these countries and that a lot of the money will be in the form of leverage or guarantees for private investment that may not actually come because business will be so weak or would have come anyway and therefore you don't really need that kind of leverage. So I think there is a big question mark about that fund. It is a bit of a make or break moment for, for the European Commission. If they can bring that off, a massive expansion of the budget 
that would be an ama- you know, a pretty formidable, formidable achievement for, for the European project. Um, so um, we should always remember, as Vince said, that the European Union does have a, a tremendous ca- capacity to muddle through. Um, it can be surprisingly resilient. Um, it has got stronger uh, instruments than it did 10 years ago uh, for fighting crises. But we shouldn't underestimate the, the longer term corrosive effects of this crisis on the project. I don't believe it will collapse. I don't think the euro will collapse because it's very hard to exit the euro in a way that isn't tremendously destructive and, and explosive. Um, but I think we will see some serious social fallout and a big rise in euro skepticism in certain countries. Uh, Italy is already there, as Natalie will no doubt tell us. Um, but Spain, one of the most pro-European countries, may well turn against the bloc unless they can come up with a real demonstration of meaningful solidarity. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Ben, for a really wonderful and insightful speech. I'd finally like to welcome to the floor Natalie Tocci. Natalie is director of the Italian think tank, Instituto Affari Internazionali, and honorary professor at the University of Tübingen. She has been special advisor to EU High Representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs, on behalf of whom she wrote the European Global Strategy. Natalie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lara. And, uh, oops, I'm sorry about that. Um, and I realised this is supposed to be a debating society, meaning that we're supposed to be taking different positions. <laughs> but I, I'm afraid that our positions are not are not all that different after all. Um, Let me start off by saying that I agree with uh, all of those that said, and and, and Ben put it very starkly, this is a make it a break it moment, I would say, not only for the European Commission, for the EU as a whole. And indeed, there are aspects of this crisis that really uh, do sort of go at the heart of of the very essence of the European project, yeah? Uh, So be it um, the four freedoms that um, that Vince and Ben were were referring to. Uh, Incidentally, on on this, uh, there was a poll that my institute did that we just published uh, today that actually showed that um, Italians, uh, and I I suspect that it's not really all that different uh, in, in other countries, Um, A sort of worrying majority of Italians are not only against uh, free movement of labor, but also free movement of goods, Uh, uh, you know, in in the context, and it was a poll sort of, you know, taken a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, to the extent to which these public attitudes continue, obviously they do sort of really go at the heart of what the European project has, has you know, has been, has been about and has always been about. Uh, Likewise, on the question of of democracy, Uh, you know, at the moment, the spotlight is not as much as it should be on uh, cases uh, like Hungary, because we're also preoccupied with the health and with the economic dimension of this crisis. But it's very clear that unless we find a satisfactory uh, um, sort of way out of how do we deal with countries that are not only practically, but even formally no longer democracies, the whole reason why we're together sort of uh, really, really comes apart. And then obviously there's the, the, the question of solidarity, which of course, and here one can look at COVID-19 as being, as many have said, a trend accelerator because it is basically the sort of third iteration of, of, a, of a problem of solidarity. Uh, we've had the Eurozone crisis, we have the migration crisis, and here comes uh, COVID-19 on top of it. Now, so having said all this, so I definitely do see why it is a a make it or break it moment. Um, I do think that I'm not the only one who sees it. Uh, And I think that everyone sees it this way. And, um, you know, be it in the member states or in the institutions, there is a far greater perception than there was compared certainly to the Eurozone crisis that this is a make it or break it moment. And therefore that there is a much greater appreciation of the need to rise to the challenge. Uh, and so, indeed, after you know the first what couple of weeks of silence, full steps, I think it is important to stress that um, pretty big steps as far as you know how things you know the muddling through that we're so used to. Um, so, if that's our benchmark, pretty big, big steps uh, have already been been taken. I mean, you know, I'm not going to go through the shopping list again, but 
um, you know, suspending the growth and stability pact, uh, in you know, sort of in inserting a which had been debated basically since what 2014 at least uh, an unemployment insurance scheme uh, the 2000 uh, billion from the European Investment Bank of course the massive uh, extra 750 billion from the uh, uh, European Central Bank the reformed ESM I mean all of this together so be it from the Commission side, far more importantly from uh, the European Central Bank, uh, importantly also, I think, from the European Investment Bank. Uh, all of this constitutes, I think, a significant bridging set of instruments. Now, it's clear that the jury is out and the jury will <laughs> go one way or another, depending on, on how the, the big game of the recovery fund and then obviously the connection between that and the next multi-annual financial framework will go. And I agree with, with Ben. Um, yes, we all know that this is what's supposed to happen, but it's not at all certain that it will happen. Um, but at least, as I said, the good news is that um, it seems to me that leaders in Europe, uh, and we don't have great leaders in Europe, be it a member state or, or, or at EU level, but nonetheless, they get it. They understand that this is what has to be done. And as I said, I think this is different compared to where we were 10 years ago with the Eurozone crisis. Now, I think also um, with respect to, for instance, um, yeah, my personal reading, even if I'm Italian, of the German constitutional court um, it, it is actually potentially somewhat different. Um, yes, it can be read as a uh, sort of dangerous assault on the primacy uh, of the uh, uh, of the European uh, Court of the, uh, of the of the European Court of Justice, but it could also be read. And of course, there it's uh, important to set the record straight. And in the sense, the Commission has already done its bit. I'm, I'm uh, of, of no doubt that uh, the ECJ will do likewise. But a second aspect, I think, of that ruling was basically saying something which is actually not incorrect, uh, which is that the um, ECB has essentially been overstepping uh, its mandate and doing things that monetary policy is actually not supposed to do. It's fiscal policy <laughs> that's supposed to do a lot of the heavy lifting. So in a sense, you could have the complete opposite reading. It could actually be a very Europeanist uh, reading of basically saying, actually, the problem is that we don't have sufficient uh, fiscal instruments at European level, and therefore there is a default sort of over-reliance uh, on, on, on monetary policy. Um, and of course, so, so, so it, it, you know, uh, in that reading, that would be a reading that would actually serve potentially as a boost towards uh, an ambitious uh, recovery fund. So I think, as I said, you know, on, on, on the internal uh, side of things, the jury is out. And, you know, I think, Ben, you're absolutely right. Um, even if we do rise to the challenge, or, or perhaps let me put it this way, uh, we're only going to rise to the cha challenge if we actually don't go back exactly to how we were. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I think that obviously there will have to be some things that will remain, well, that will have to go back to how they were. I mean, you know, the, the four freedoms, obviously, and democracy kind of being, uh, <laughs> being sort of two pretty important things. Um, but I do think that, I mean, in a sense, resilience is all about change. Uh, so, for instance, to, to take the example that you're raising about state aid rules, um, you know, I think in a world in which actually we've, and, and this has not been raised by COVID-19, it's been exposed by COVID-19, um, in which we are facing, um, you know, the kind of competition that we're facing from China, in which the rationale for the European project has become a far more global rationale. Well, maybe we should be re-looking at how we think about things like state aid as well. So it's not necessarily bad, not, you know, if on everything, we don't go back to, to how things were. Now, you know, so my, my general sense is that when we get to sort of the, the, the more internal uh, aspect, which of course is the, the, in many respects the most important, uh, I'm not entirely pessimistic. Where I think um, the challenge is far greater is on the global. And here I'm, I'm far more pessimistic than, than Maria is. Uh, I think we're looking ahead to years in which we're going to be um, sort of looking inside, you know, largely because obviously the challenges that we're facing inside are so existential. Um, but of course, the world outside doesn't stop. 
Uh, and if we do have, obviously, you know, the US-China rivalry uh, and, you know, us being increasingly sort of uh, pulled apart or pulled to one side or another between uh, uh, Trump, hopefully not after November, but who knows, uh, and whatever happens in the United States, obviously the US-China competition will still remain, uh, and the Xi, which we do know will, <laughs> will remain, uh, and we're just kind of, you know, concentrated internally, well, that's a problem. What is also a problem is if we end up with, which what I think is, is quite likely, with a globalization which will have a different uh, face, which I don't, I don't think the globalization will end, but I do think that globalization will become more regionalized in nature, which incidentally adds to the internal rationale for the European Union. But the point I wanted to make now is slightly a different one. Um, my, my sense is that we may actually end up seeing um, probably the most important continent um, surrounding the European Union being very much left to its own devices, and that's Africa. Uh, we may well see in a more regionalized, globalized world, um, China actually becoming slightly more Asia-centric, slightly uh, less sort of Belt and Road oriented. Uh, well, the United States was never particularly interested in Africa either. Uh, and Africa, even if COVID-19 uh, does not reach Africa in the way in which it reached Europe. So even if there isn't a sim uh, you know, simply a sort of uh, lag of the curve, but there is a significantly different shaped curve, which is of course is what we're all hoping and praying for. But even in that rosy scenario, the indirect effects uh, on you know, socially, politically, and security terms, of course, economically, on Africa are going to be completely devastating. And um, yes, you know, we, we talk about uh, a global response, but when it comes to development uh, aid, for instance, um, well, when we talk internally about the European Union, we're in, you know, in a conversation about trillions. Uh, when we talk about Africa, we've added 5 billion well, that's not exactly what needs to be done to, <laughs> to, uh, to, to rise to that challenge. Now, of course, it's very different, you know, it's very difficult, if not impossible, and this is where the pessimism comes in to sort of do what we have to do internally and at the same time have that sort of global reach, which is why I think the multilateral piece is uh, so important. It's the only way in which we can actually square the circle. Uh, and so to end on that slightly more positive note, uh, I do think that um, the way in which not only the Commission but Member States as well uh, handled the pledge, uh, the, the global pledge, was actually a, a case of success which can be replicated on other aspects, uh, COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 related. Uh, and, and to sort of make also the link to the EU-UK sort of post-Brexit um, uh, or, or Europe, yeah, sort of cooperation, I think that actually 2021 uh, offers an interesting prospect of basically having three key multilateral fora or formats, uh, i.e. the G7, the G20 and COP26, uh, being all chaired uh, by European countries, uh, one of which is the United Kingdom. Uh, now, this, in a sense, offers a fantastic opportunity um, to basically have a multilateral European uh, push in, in multilateral contexts, uh, which not only aims at coordinating a global economic recovery, uh, but, uh, and, and to make the link back also to the green agenda, ensures that that global economic recovery is also a green one. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Natalie, for an incredibly interesting speech. Um, in terms of opening up the floor, Maria, obviously a lot of the panelists disagree with your positivity about the European project. Do you have any responses to those arguments? Yes, one thing that, uh, um, two points. One about the, the budget and the recovery plan. Um, so the budget and the recovery plan is, uh, is has been, um, developed by the European Commission has been, uh, the communication is not out yet, but has been announced uh, on Wednesday in the European Parliament by, by the President of the Commission and uh, explained in detail. Um, it was voted in the European Parliament 
and we managed to have the votes of the uh, major uh, political parties from the EPP, the, the, the Renew, that are the, the Liberals, the Socialists, the, the, the Greens, the ECR. Um, and uh, this has a, a, an important point because, for example, uh, in the group that I belong, that is the EPP, uh, we have many of the colleagues and we had long discussion and many of the colleagues are from countries where uh, they have governments, EPP governments, and usually they are in line uh, with the decisions of the governments. And for the first time, I saw the willing that usually doesn't happen, didn't happen in previous budgets. I saw the willing to support uh, this um, recovery plan and this budget because of the situation that we are in. And also because this time the budget and the recovery plan that are linked together have been built uh, in a very innovative way. Uh, the way that uh, the Commission proposed to increase the overall value uh, of this package, budget and recovery plan, uh, is to increase uh, an, an headroom, it's a bit technical, but they increase their headroom due to own resources. And in this margin, with this margin, they go to the market to, the, to, to, the market to borrow money that has the EU budget as a guarantee. So in the end, and they will lend this money to the member states and to the companies, in the end, uh, the member states do not increase their contributions. Of course, we are in uh, some time in the future, we need to pay back. Uh, they say that is after 2027, it was the information of the commission, but the initial contribution from the member states maybe is of the same magnitude that as it was foreseen. So in certain way, because of this innovative arch architecture and they were willing to, uh, to agree on this solution. Um, so they're not putting more money on the table, this, the, the, the member states, but they are agreeing to share risk because if, they, uh, if a country uh, will not pay what it gets in terms of uh, loans, uh, the European um, budget will have to, to pay and there is a risk, there is a share risk because the European budget is um, contribution of all the member states. Uh, and it's there that I saw the difference. This is the first time that countries, mainly the countries that we usually talk, uh, call them the frugal countries that are uh, countries like uh, Netherlands, uh, Denmark, Sweden, uh, that usually are not willing to share the risks with other countries that are more difficult, like the southern countries. They, for the first time, they were willing to um, support a solution like this. And this is a big difference uh, and what makes me uh, to be more optimistic. Um, of course, all that needs to be uh, voted in the European Council, but I'm convinced because of these discussions in the European Parliament that the position in the Council and in the Euro group is going to be also to be supported. Um, there is one point that uh, I agree with, uh, with Ben uh, Hall and also Natalie on the, the globalization and some risks of this deglobalization. And I go a bit further. When we are now um, trying to, to, to bring production back to Europe and to have a more regional uh, globalization, uh, I uh, it was mentioned that there is a risk of nationalism. I, I also add the risk of protectionism, uh, national, but also European. And in, this is not good for our economy, it's not good for the European project. We need, of course, uh, to have some strategic uh, uh, approach to certain areas that are very important to our survival, like some of the 
components for medicine, some of the medical equipment, but in general, we should not uh, uh, become protectionists. We should continue with our openness to the world because uh, it's, the, it's a very important strength for our economy that gives us the possibility to export with our block is one of the, the strongest uh, exporters in the world, countries like Germany, and we should continue to, to, to have global trade and to be open um, uh, to trade like we have been uh, until now. So I'm also a bit afraid of this uh, strategic resilience approach uh, to the um, um, uh, to to the the supply chains that was already there before the crisis, but now has been more um, uh, always present in the speech, mainly from the commissioners. Uh, I try to to in the European Parliament to. to questions the, the commissioners always about this point because I think that we have a lot to gain to continue with the open and global free trade uh, um, all over the world. So this is my first reactions to the to the comments of the, the panel. Thank you so much for that Maria and one thing I'm picking up from that is your ideas of sharing risk. Um, to all our panelists, one big criticism of the Eurozone is that centralised monetary policy can't be reconciled with varying fiscal policy. Do you think that COVID-19 could compound that problem, as some countries, which have been very hard hit by coronavirus, like Italy, will require far, far more government spending than countries which have been less affected, like Greece? Yes. <laughs> I think you you put it brilliantly. Um, I do think that is a big problem. Um, and it was partly or picking up on something that Natalie said um, earlier. Um, I think the problem is that the Eurozone has become far too dependent on the European Central Bank um, to prop up the economy, or, or rather to prop up, uh, to keep borrowing costs down for businesses and governments. Um, and there, it's we've got a lopsided system, and so much rides on the European Central Bank, which um, is actually heavily constrained um, politically and legally about what it can do. Much more so, arguably, than the U.S. Federal Reserve or, or the Bank of England or the Bank of Japan. Um, and uh, as we saw in this German constitutional court ruling, it's an impediment to the ECB uh, doing more. If the ECB could do what it wanted, we wouldn't have a problem because it could carry on buying up government bonds for eternity. And it really wouldn't matter how much debt Italy had or Spain had. Um, but we really don't think that that is um, sustainable for political reasons, um, and arguably it may not even be sustainable for economic reasons, but that's another another argument. Um, so I think this crisis has, in a very short space of time, exposed the, once again, um, the lack of a common fiscal instrument. I don't think it means um, a European government or political union, um, uh, which can sound very scary. Um, uh, but it does require some form of risk sharing, uh, even if it's a kind of insurance system that can help governments out when they get into trouble and can stop this kind of what they call a doom loop, whereby your borrowing costs go up and your banks get into more trouble and then your, your debt becomes more expensive. So your borrowing costs go up. Um, the, the Europe did not resolve this problem after the last financial crisis. And it's come it's coming back to haunt, or sorry, the Eurozone didn't solve this problem at the in the last financial crisis and it's coming back to haunt it very very quickly so it could be that the recovery fund is the kernel of this idea um, which would be a major achievement equally it could be a little bit of a conjuring trick this recovery fund and not really be proper risk sharing at all or be so small and so time limited that it wouldn't give the block um, the insurance policy that it needs. Uh, we'll, we'll find out in the next few weeks. Natalie, were you signaling that you had something to say? 
Um, yes, very briefly, because I agree with everything that, that, that Ben said, but I just did want to add something which is going to sound very un-Italian uh, for me. Um, meaning that I, I think the magic word really is risk sharing. Um, and it's often not the way uh, countries like mine tend to talk and think about the European Union. And that also has to change. I mean, the European Union is not Father Christmas. Uh, and should not be understood as Father Christmas. I mean, it's not something that is, and, and this goes to the debate of the balance between grants and loans to an extent. Um, it, it's not something that is simply there to kind of give us money. It's something from which we should all be benefiting from pr precisely because risk by pooling it is, um, is reduced. Um, but, but this is, so I, I think it's a conceptual leap that it's not just the sort of frugal countries that have to make, <laughs> but also those that, you know, like, like my own, that um, do talk about a fiscal union, but talk about a fiscal union in a way which does not really correspond to what fiscal union is really all about. And thank you. And Vince, were you signaling? Yeah, could I add something? I think Natalie made a very important point in the first round of comments when she said that the effect of the German court ruling could actually be to clarify the respective roles of fiscal budgetary policy on the one hand and money on the other hand, and the fact that the ECB are straying into fiscal policy. I mean, I, I worry about this actually because this crisis is so severe that other central banks, uh, Japan, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England, are almost certainly having to go further down the track of monetizing deficits. Um, in other words, directly financing the deficits of the government rather than just traditional QE. Um, and, and the ECB is constrained from doing that. And if as Natalie suggests, uh, the effects of these legal challenges are to reinforce purity, um, it will make the whole crisis much more difficult to manage. And if we are going in the direction of purity and having a proper fiscal response, um, almost certainly this has got to take the form of you know, grant type or soft loan type transfers, you know, as would happen in a federal state like the US. Um, there is absolutely no point um, other countries in the European Union uh, supporting Italy with sem commercial or semi-commercial loans. Its debt is already on the brink of unsustainability. So we're not just talking about um, you know, fiscal transfers, but on a highly concessional terms. Uh, I suspect that would be very difficult for the Germans to buy into and the, and the Finns and, and others, but that is what, what has got to happen. Thank you, that's really interesting set of thoughts. Just being aware of time, I think I'd like to end on one final question. We all seem quite positive about the future of the European project. We seem to believe that it will survive. Um, I'd like to ask you sort of how you think it will look. Will the Schengen zone survive? Will border controls between EU member states be the new normal? I mean, Vince, um, you mentioned that the EU should consider expelling Hungary post, post this, but what in practice would this look like? We in the UK know that leaving the EU isn't as difficult as it should sound. Should we try and maintain some sort of trade deal with Hungary or should we kick them out with a no deal WTO rule sort of thing? So how do you envisage post this crisis, the European project looking? Well, I think if the European Union is going to mean anything in the longer run, then there is no way of avoiding this issue. Um, I mean, Britain is the first country to exit, uh, and it is proving a very messy process. Uh, and I, I think in practice, I think once the Hungarians were got the sense that the European Union was serious, then I think they would conform, um, you know, but we don't know. And as with Brexit, there is going to be quite a lot of brinkmanship. But I think if, and let, if the European Union isn't will, willing to stand up for basic democratic principles, uh, then, you know, a lot, of, a lot of Europeans will cease to believe in it. And did any of our other panelists have thoughts on the sort of post-COVID European project? Gonna 
Yes, um, I think that uh, also depend how long is this lockdown and the crisis? Because if we have uh, or a vaccine, we know that the vaccine probably is going to, to take longer, but uh, a therapy that is efficient and efficacious quite soon that give us um, the, um, the possibility to return to a more normal life. And uh, the consequences were much smaller than if there is a long period of time. If there is a long period of time, one year more or one year and a half more, uh, it's going to be difficult that some of the, I think that was Ben that mentioned, um, the, the, the European Union has come aside uh, and gave back to the member states and well that it did um, state aid rules, um, restrictions on the use of the regional funds, no need to have co-financing, completely flexibility, doesn't uh, set up the, the, the priorities for the use of the regional funds so they, the member states can use it uh, where they need. Uh, so if this takes very long, it's going to be difficult to, to go back to the... If it's a short period, it was like... A, a parent, uh, parenthesis and we go back to what we were but if it's long if it's more than um, than one year or uh, a full year is going to be difficult so the importance of investing on research working together to get a solution is key for for this crisis we need to get out of this crisis as soon as possible and even psychological if we know that there is already under uh, under development quite near the end some kind of therapy that is going to be uh, very efficient we will start to behave in a different way and all the member states because it's not only a question to open the borders it's a question of getting trust even if the borders are open if we if the, the consumer if the persons do not trust they will not travel so we really need to, to feel confident and to trust the system so that we can go to, to have mobility, uh, to start consuming again. And that is uh, very, very important. On the question of Hungary, I, I fully agree to the fact that if uh, we are more severe in terms of recommendations and sanctions, uh, Hungary we will adapt. Uh, because we have, and I think we all understand, there are countries with the, the uh, different uh, uh, histories. They had a, a past completely different from ours. They they are developing in the, in a different way. So we really need to 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 draw the attention for for that fact. And I I I would believe that both in the European Parliament and we have vote. Um, in the inside the EPP, but still uh, the, no final decision has been done uh, uh, re relating to the position of the Fidesz, uh, the Hungarian Fidesz inside the EPP. We also have vote to, for them to leave the EPP, but they are still there in a, um, a kind of limbo. Uh, but we should press it more because they will complain because they are uh, urban is a, a very clever and uh, um, experienced politician and he's trying to see until when he can go uh, and and i think that they will continue to to be in the european union and they would change if we are more severe with the the requirements for a, a democratic uh, um, behaving in, in Hungary. Lara, I, I, if I could just interject, I think a lot will depend on Germany as ever. Um, uh, the probability is that the European Union and the Eurozone will sort of limp along in a less than perfect state. That wouldn't be a disaster, but if Germany decides that it really wants to rebalance the union, have proper risk sharing, take a proper geopolitical um, uh, strategic sense of where of Europe's place in the world, which is 
becoming a lot more hostile towards Europe, more hostile America, a more hostile China, as we've seen in recent weeks, then Germany maybe would galvanize a much stronger and more effective European response. Um, but if Germany carries on with the same sort of slightly parochial, we're doing fine mindset, then I think Europe will be sort of condemned to, to limp along. And uh, Natalie, did you have any thoughts? Um, I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, um, just to sort of add to, to this, and I, I agree with, uh, with, with the Germany point uh, very, very strongly, but um, just to sort of add a, a more global perspective to this, I mean, I think that on the one hand, I mean, I'm, I'm slightly of two minds of this, yeah, because you can see the way in which in a world which is going to be more normatively contested, uh, uh, because largely because of the, of the US-China confrontation, that normative contestation is going to continue playing out and perhaps will continue to play out even more forcefully than it has done so far within the European Union. Um, and, uh, and by this, I don't just mean the direct influence uh, that the Chinese or the US will have uh, and, and what they will do on the European continent, um, but more the way in which it's, it's more of the, the, the Hungary type situation that I'm thinking about. I mean, the sort of quote unquote soft power, uh, uh, the authoritarian styles of governance have in a world which in which there is going to be that normative contestation between what is the effective system of government, <laughs> government uh, uh, governance basically. Uh, and, and public opinions are going to be increasingly be of, of, of different minds uh, uh, about this. So obviously this adds a sort of, you know, sort of strong centrifugal forces uh, within the European Union uh, and, and within member states, I would add as well. As well. Um, at, at the same time, I think that um, th there is, so sort of at least two causes for, for optimists. I mean, and the, the, the first that has to do with the Euroscepticism point. I mean, yes, you can see all sorts of reasons why Euroscepticism could increase. Uh, but at the same time, I think that precisely because of the gravity of this crisis, um, I struggle to think of countries that are very Eurosceptic these days, such as my own, uh, that actually think that there can be a national solution to this problem. Um, the, the crisis is just far too great to assume that we can get out of this uh, at national level. I also think, to add another optimistic note, that the political season that we've seen over the last decade, basically, which well, you know, essentially since um, the Eurozone crisis, which was one which saw the rise of nationalist populism, blah, 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 all over the world, not just in Europe, of course, um, could actually end after this crisis. Uh, and that is for all sorts of reasons, beginning with the fact that there has been a sort of uh, resurrected role of competence and expertise, uh, which of course is kind of public enemy number one for the populists, yeah? Um, on top of that, there is not only the sort of need for that, I mean, you know, the fact that there cannot be a national solution, it can only be European, but also that there can only be a multilateral global solution to this. Uh, and and uh, you know, uh, and, and, and you know, it, it, the, the globalize, globalization could become more regionalized. But as I said, it's very difficult to imagine that one that every single country is going to succeed in having critical supplies of everything uh, within their national borders. So obviously, there will have to be regional blocks, uh, of which uh, the European Union, of course, is is a core of one. Incidentally, I actually think this adds an important transatlantic structural potential for, stru for transatlantic convergence, which of course would require someone in the White House to seize that opportunity, but that's, that's a different conversation. So I think these two sets of kind of, you know, the, the, the optimism and the pessimism really coexist. I, can, I don't think that this is an either or, and I can't quite figure out how it's going to uh, coexist because obviously they're pulling in very different directions. But perhaps this is just the story of the European Union as it's always been. I just want to say thank you so much on behalf of both myself and our members to all our participants in this panel. I think this has been an incredibly expansive, wide reaching and really fascinating event. I think um, I've enjoyed hearing about the future of the European project and I'm really emboldened by the positivity put forth. 
I know that in these uncertain times, taking time out of your day to address us can be hard and we're all really grateful for your time. So thank you again, Vince, Maria, Ben and Natalie, as well as our wonderful AV team for making this possible. Thanks to you.